Morning. Come on. Good morning. It's Easter. How are we doing? Awesome. Can you help me welcome all of the people that are joining us online for this hour? They're watching live in their pajamas right now. Awesome, awesome stuff, man. The thing that they're not experiencing is, is they're not experiencing how warm it is in this room right now. So can you guys help us out back there and just turn the fans on? That'd be awesome. And uh, we'll get some air moving because these are not meant to be fans. Oh, sorry. Fans. All right. And uh, this broken microphone. But anyways, these are meant to be surveys for you. So I'm going to talk to you about them real quickly. We love every Easter to get information from you because literally what you're going to do is you're going to help shape what I'm going to preach about and our teaching team is going to teach about over the next few months. And so we're asking that question, question one, everything you've ever wanted to know. And uh, you just fill it in right there. And uh, some of you just take it upon yourselves to call every once in a while just to tell me what you want to know. And uh, like, hey, you should preach about this. And uh, great, and sure God will tell me that just like he told you eventually, all right? And so, uh, so if you can fill that out. Then the next is just, you know, what's some of the greatest barriers to somebody from knowing God right now that you're hearing about? Because here's what I recognize. You're in the real world, and I live in a Christian bubble most days, and so we want to know what's really happening. And then we ask that weird question about how far away you live. You can even write your city in there or your town, because the reality is, is if you look around, every one of our services look like this, so we're about out of chairs, we're about out of room, and every Every part of our building. We're getting ready to do a, an expansion of our children's space because that's important to us here at the river. But uh, the only other option we would have is to build like an $8 million, $10 million building on the back side of the building, which someday we'll do. I believe that. But we don't have that right now unless you have it and you want to write a check today. We can make that happen, all right? But until then, and we'll probably put H back in it that doesn't make you cold. Can we get an amen, all right? And, uh, but anyways, we might potentially be looking at how we go campusing again and spread ourselves out. On the campusing note, man, our campus in Chesterton yesterday had almost 300 people show up to their outreach event. So, man, we're celebrating what God's doing there, and it's exciting stuff. And so, and then on the back, as Pastor Amy said, I'll refer to the bottom pieces of it at the end of this message. And so, man, I'm excited to jump right into God's Word today. And uh, if you are new here, I am Pastor Matthew. It's my privilege and my wife's privilege, Nicole, to be your lead pastors. And so we're excited with what God's up to at the river. And uh, man, we are juiced about Easter, and uh, it's going to be a great day. Are you ready? Okay, there's two of you. I trust this is going to be good. I heard the online crowd was exquisitely loud. I heard them. All right. Are you ready? All right. When you turn to the Bible, you'll see in the, we have Old Testament, New Testament, and the Old Testament is 39 books, the New Testament is 27 books, total of 66 books, but the first four books of what we call the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are what we call the Gospels. Last week, you remember, I told you there's 89 chapters in those books. Of those 89 chapters, four of those chapters deal with the first 30 years of Jesus' life. There's 85 chapters left that deal with the next three years of his life. And there's literally 29 of the 85 deal with the final week of Jesus' life. And Easter Sunday is the culmination of that week. Amen? And, uh, and so we're going to jump in and just dive right into what is my favorite gospel. Which one, You want to guess what my favorite gospel is? No, it's the book of John. All right, and so we're going to jump into the book of John and, uh, and dig in and see what God has in store for us. I'm going to read through some scriptures, and we're going to talk about it, and hopefully you'll laugh. And if you don't want to laugh today and have a little bit of fun, then you're at the wrong church, all right? Are you with me? Because I believe firmly that the joy of the Lord is what? Our strength, all right? So if you don't have any joy in your life, or maybe today you're going to find some joy, okay? So loosen up. Look at your neighbor and say, loosen up a little bit, all right? This isn't Grandma's church. All right, so here we go. Grandma had a great church, but man, it's kind of stubby. Anyways, moving on. Here we go. John 20. It says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, which was who? John. And said, which is interesting that he's writing it like, hey, uh, <laughs> the one he loved. Anyways, moving on. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. This is Mary talking. A.K.A. Mary doesn't believe that he's resurrected from the dead. He, she actually believes that he's just been stole. 
I want you to, I want you to get it. He, she's confused. She's having a crisis of faith. See, we have the advantage that we know the end of the story, all right? She doesn't know the end of the story. She's having this crisis moment like, man, my Savior, my Lord. Remember, Mary Magdalene was the one who literally had, was possessed with seven demons that Jesus came along and literally gave her freedom from that. And so she's been following Jesus ever since. And so all of a sudden, she's like, where have they put him? Like, I got to know where he is at. And then we're going to fast forward because, because we can't read the whole script, scriptures today, but I'm going to give you bits and pieces of it to verse 11. And when you get there, before you get there, what you will have missed is the fact that, that Peter and John, when they looked inside the tomb, they didn't see any angels, which is interesting to me. All they saw were the, the grave clothes that Jesus would have had on. But when Mary looks in the tomb, she sees the angels. And this is her encounter with those angels in verse 11. It says, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? Now these bros, like they got guts to ask a woman why she's crying. Can I get a witness? All right. Like that, I mean, let me just help you out, men. That is not a question you ask your wife. All right. Like she comes in crying. You shouldn't be like, what's wrong with you? All right. Like what's the, what's the problem? Like, why are you crying? And you're getting slapped, all right? Don't go there. These angels, though, they had not taken pastoral counseling 101, all right? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't, she didn't realize it was Jesus because he's a gardener, she thinks. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Here's my defense in asking your wife if why she's crying. It's because if Jesus asked it, why can't I, right? Can I get a witness, men? Where are the men that have the guts to say amen to that? Amen. There's a few of you that have guts. The rest of you are cowards, all right? No, I'm just kidding. We love you. I love you, but come on. There's one over here. He's like, no, 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 don't go there. I don't want to have to do it, all right? Seriously, turn your man card in in my office after service. All right, women, why are you crying? Who is it? I'm just kidding. Who is it? Are we having fun? All right, who is it you are looking for thinking he was a gardener? She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Let me help you make sense of this gardener thing. Why would a gardener be coming to a tomb? Because this, as we know, was a tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. He was a very wealthy man. It would have never, ever been used. It was a brand new tomb. So he would have come there to, to garden and put flowers out and things like that. Jesus said to her, just says one word, Mary, or in the, in, in the original language, it would have been Maria. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher or master. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them all that she had seen and told, uh, told that she had said these things to her. All right, moving on. I was in the wrong gospel, all right? I was studying a different one this week. But when I look at this, this is a different message I preached to her at the sunrise service, so that was a different message, all right? So you're getting pieces of lots of messages. But when, you, when I read this, all I could hear in my mind as I was studying for today a few weeks ago was the voice of Ernie Johnson or Greg Gumbel saying, and folks, this is the end of the NCAA tournament, and now it's time for one shining moment. And if you're a guy like me who likes sports and who understands the highs and the lows of them, the wins and the losses, the pain and the suffering of them, I mean, are there any men that would be willing to admit that you cried, have ever cried watching One Shining Moment? Thank you. There's one of us, two of us, all right? I have. Like, I, I'm just like, oh. Like, you see these kids, like, their, their careers are over and they're crying. It's like, take the camera off of them, but get it for one shiny moment, right? Like, it's going to be good in a few weeks when they see themselves on TV. And, 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 and it's this moment. And, and this is like, if you're a TV producer, this is the one shiny moment of the entire Bible. Can I get a witness? Like, this is it. Like, this is great stuff. And so you're grabbing hold of it right here. This is our one shiny moment. How many people in the room grew up on Sesame Street. We have some Sesame Street people in here? All right. So you would know that Bert and Ernie were part of what? Oh, you don't know, do you? Who's Kermit the Frog a part of? There we go. So were they. All right. They were there first before they ever showed them over. Remember a guy named Mr. Hooper? 
Anybody remember Mr. Hooper? Remember him? I mean, he was on, him and Big Bird, they were tight. How many Big Bird fans? Come on, just loosen up. Come on. The old people in first time were all about this, all right? So, I mean, Big Bird, man, he's a cool guy. I mean, he had big beak. I mean, this thing. I mean, if you were us, man, that's what we learned from was Sesame Street. The problem was in 1982, while Mr. Hooper was on the show, Mr. Hooper died. And so the producers of Sesame Street were, were confronted with a incy bincy challenge. How do we tell 10 million children that their beloved Mr. Hooper is dead? It's not funny, but I'm kind of laughing a little bit. He's dead. How are you going to tell him? And so they, they thought, well, it's public television, so the spiritual side of it went completely out. Couldn't talk about heaven, couldn't talk about hell, so they leave that alone. So how, how are we going to tell everybody that he's dead? And so they have Big Bird draw a picture, and if you remember the episode, he brings it out to him, and he's looking all over the place for Mr. Hooper. Where's Mr. Hooper? Where's Mr. Hooper? Where's Mr. Hooper? And one of the other adults come out, and they said, Big Bird, we told you, and here was the moment, Mr. Hooper died. And so that's how 10 million children found out that Mr. Hooper, their beloved Mr. Hooper, was dead. All right? I mean, there were some of us in my generation, once Barney came around, we were like, let's kill him. All right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Bring Mr. Hooper back. Can I get a witness? All right? I mean, I hate you. You hate me. Let's hang Barney. Anyways, moving on. All right? I was not a Barney fan, man. A, a purple dinosaur was not doing it for me. All right? But Adrian, she loved Barney. Let's watch more Barney. Watch more. I hate that thing. He needs to be Big Bird. All right? So Mr. Hooper's dead. And that's how they tell 10 million people. 10 million, 10 million kids. And here's what they say, Big Bird, we told you, when people die, they don't come back. The gospel of Sesame Street has zero hope. But can I tell you, the gospel of Jesus Christ is full of hope. Because last time I checked, dead people do come back. They come back, and they've come back, and they come back, and they will come back. And so somebody in the room today, you're sitting here, you're dead right now, you don't even know it, and you're watching online, and you're dead, but I'm about ready to tell you, you're about ready to figure out what it means to come back. Mary, Mary was an eyewitness to everything that Jesus experienced. From the day that she was free from those demons, she followed Jesus. She experienced it all. She watched it from from up close and personal. She was the last one at the cross and she was the first one at the tomb and when she gets to the tomb that day, she has three questions that she has to encounter and three questions that she had to answer and I believe there are three questions you need to encounter and answer today and here's the first one. Very simple, he asked her, why are you crying? Why are you crying? I mean, I said it, you know, like, like these, like, like when I read through this passage, like now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, she swept, bent over, looking at the tomb, and two angels, and the angels asked, woman, why are you crying? There's a part of me as I read these, like remember, I'm, if you're new to me, like, like I like to kind of get creative as I read God's word and something, and there's these two angels, they're looking at this woman, they're like, doesn't this earthling know that he's risen from the dead? How, like, how, can, how can she not know that he actually did and everything he said he would do? And then, and then Jesus makes this, has the same conversation. Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Like, what, what are you doing, woman? Why are you doing this? I mean, Mary's response could have been one of anger. Like, dudes, haven't you guys read social media? Like, haven't you read the local newspaper? Don't you, where were you at the last week? I mean, last week he came in on a colt, man, and we praised him and laid down palm branches and our coats and we celebrated by Thursday, they were arresting him and beating him out in the street. Where have you guys been? That could have been Mary's response. Instead, her response was very simple. They've taken my Savior. They've taken my Lord, and I need to know where he is at. And when you come to that place, you have to come to this place where when you're asked the question today, you need to maybe admit your point of pain like this is what hurts in my life Mary doesn't respond like like maybe some of us would like like when somebody well why are you crying well let me wipe the tears there's no reason I'm not I'm not I'm just my eyes are watering oh I got salt in them 
I got salt in them from the egg bites at the sunrise service that you guys all missed, all right? So, so those were good egg bites, by the way. Just throw that out there. But, but like, oh, I got salt in my eye. I just, I'm just crying. I'm not crying. But Mary just readily admits she doesn't stop crying. She just simply says, man, this is why I'm crying. Somebody today, you just need to admit this is where I'm in pain at. When so, today, he's asking you, why are you crying? Why are you struggling? See, Mary isn't the first person to stand in a cemetery asking questions, overcoming with the, the sting of death. She's not the first person to stand in a cemetery overcome with sorrow. Maybe you're here today and you're still stinging from the death of a loved one. Maybe you're still hurting and still questioning the diagnosis that the doctor gave you, saying, well, how could God make that happen? I'll let that happen. Your eyes are filled with tears today because of the broken marriage that you know you're living with. Your heart is breaking because your kids have turned their back on God. I could stand here and go on for hours and hours of different situations of pain that we all suffer from. But can I just tell you this? I just want you to hear me. I want you to, I want you to hear what I'm about to say. God cares about your pain. He cared about the pain of Mary at the tomb. Nobody in the room, look around, nobody in the room, nobody watching online, nobody in any of our cam the camps, nobody, nobody is immune from pain. Everybody has suffered it from it. Everybody has dealt with it. But you have to take off the mask, take off the persona that your life is perfect, that you have it all figured out, that everything in your life is a bed of roses, and say, you know what? There's some things in my life that just aren't good, and it hurts. But can I tell you this? I love the way David writes it in Psalm 30, verse 5, where he says, For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts life. Weeping may stay for the night. Come on. But rejoicing, what, what, what? rejoicing comes when in the morning I'm here to tell you God cares about your pain and in the darkness of it he's there with you because I'm here to tell you there is light coming that tomb of your life is about to be open the second question she has to answer is who or what are you looking for you need to answer that question today look at verses 15 and 16 it says thinking he was the gardener she said sir if you have carried him away tell me where you have put him and I will get him Jesus said to her Mary she stops I can see it like she's like whoa I don't recognize this guy but I recognize that voice I don't recognize him but I recognize the voice and she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic Rabbi which means teacher or master that's my savior I mean as I listen to different pastors talk about this passage and I read about this passage and there are some things that I'm like, man, Matthew, I can't believe like you missed that after all of these years of all of the studying of that passage that you've done, like you missed it. But what I've missed is this little place right here where she says, thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him. And then look what she says. What will she do? I will get him. Now let's just use our imaginations. I'm not real sure that Mary was into CrossFit or weightlifting or, or what she was into, but I'm sure she was a fairly fit lady. Let's give her 115 pounds. You know, she's, you know, this is probably what she weighed. I, I mean, I'll be honest, like Rhonda who sings on our worship team, that's kind of how I imagine Mary, about your size. All right, she's right here. All right, so, and so, I mean, no offense, Rhonda, not, not like probably, you know, going to throw around a ton of weight. All right, and so let's just say Jesus, uh, you know, he's pretty, he's a carpenter, tough guy, probably not going my size because he was in shape. Uh, let's say he's 185. Is that fair? I could imagine Jesus probably pretty buff, all right? If he wasn't, he could make himself real quick without Photoshop, all right? <laughs> like he walks out, he'd just be like, J -j 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 -j. you know, it's like, anyways, moving on. Told you I'd get creative, man, it's my mind. It's like squirrel, there it goes, all right? So, so let's just say Jesus about 185, and they would have wrapped him in all this, on all these, this, uh, the different burial pieces that they would have put with him all the incense and the myrrh, that would have had weight to it. They say somewhere between, scholars say between 40 and 50 pounds of extra weight they would have put on Jesus inside of the tomb. And so that would have gone with him when they stole his body is what she's thinking. So let's just say 
Jesus at that point is 225. And look at Mary's response. She doesn't think about what's in front of her. She doesn't think about the thing that's going to stop her. She simply says, hey, just tell me where he's at and I'll get him. Because here's what I know. When you're driven by love and when our hope and faith are shattered, you'll do crazy things when you're driven that way. You'll be driven by that love. She was going to go get him. She didn't know how she was going to get him, but she knew that her Savior wasn't in that grave. Remember, she still thinks at this point, she hasn't heard his voice yet. She still thinks he's dead. But Jesus, seeing her pain, could no longer conceal himself from her. Maria, and her eyes light up. The same voice that she would have heard when she had those demons removed out of her was now the same voice that she's hearing at an empty tomb. And then she knows he's alive. And Maria, what have you come here looking for today? I told you this is what I would do. Why are you here? Why are you crying? I told you I would, be, I would rise from the dead. Can I tell you today, we live in a culture where people, everybody is looking for something. People today, more than ever, we're searching for truth. I hear it. We're searching for answers for the end times, which, by the way, I believe we're living in the end times. And I, could, I haven't seen these cards yet, but I'm, I'm going to almost guarantee it that there's a lot of questions about heaven and revelation that is going to come through. I only know that because I've had about 20 of you ask me, when are you going to preach a series on the end times? Tell us about this Russia thing. And so, man, I, I haven't started it, but I'm pretty confident that we're going to have an end time series sometime this year. Um, but I'll just give you this. I believe we are living in the end times. I believe our days are numbered. And, man, I'll be straight up with you, man. I can't wait. In a few weeks, I'm going to share at Vision Night about a ministry that we're getting involved with to help speed that process up. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to die. The pro I'm not afraid of dying, but the process is what I don't really want to enjoy. But I ain't afraid of meeting Jesus. Right. Come on. Look, I tell you this, man. People are looking for truth. People are looking for purpose. And, and, and we're, we're going in so many directions looking for all this stuff because, because we, we see the next big thing, the next, the next toy, the next piece of technology, the newest, the biggest, the best. And we just keep grabbing hold of it. And we just keep accumulating all of this stuff. And what happens is, is we don't, it just weighed us down, man. And, and we get there and we're like, well, that didn't do it for me. And 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 I'm here to tell you, I'll tell you what will do it for you. His name is Jesus. That's it. And you can have your one shining moment. Here's what I know. Proverbs 14, Solomon tells us, there's a way that appears right to be right, but in the end it leads to death. There's lots of things. I'm not telling you some of the things that we're getting into are bad. I'm just telling you they appear to be right, but in the end, they don't end up in the light. They end up in the darkness. And some of you, you're chasing it. You're like, man, but you got to start by admitting, here's why I'm in pain. This is what hurts, and this is real. And he gets what? He's like, I get it. I'm with you. And then just simply say, this is what I've been searching for. But today I need to search for you. Anne Lamott, she's a, a, a writer. If you've ever read any of her writings, she writes to a lot of women's books and different books on faith. And She wasn't always a believer. Uh, matter of fact, she was an atheist, almost, I mean, almost an atheist, probably agnostic at best. I was reading one of her books a few weeks ago, studying for a different series, and she shares her testimony. Man, it just struck me as I prepared for this morning. I thought, man, that's it. And, and, and she tells the story of how she came to know Christ, and she didn't want anything to do with Jesus, and she was partying on the scene, and had gotten pregnant and went to have an abortion. Her friend took her. She has the abortion that night. She's in her room all by herself. She lived on a houseboat. And she, she took the codeine that the nurse gave her and followed it with a bunch of liquor and went to sleep. In the middle of the night, she feels like somebody's watching her in the corner of this boat. And she talks about the presence of her dad and all this stuff, but she, she doesn't really move to that and Eventually she can't, it's kind of tormenting her, so she gets up and she turns on the light, obviously there's no one there. The next morning she begins to describe this experience, like she described it like, like there was a cat that was following her, 
And like she's, and she describes, she's a very creative writer. That this may be why I like her. She's a little twisted, maybe. Uh, she's like, she described this presence like a cat. She said, "Man, it was like a cat, and if I turned around and petted it or fed it, it was going to follow me home." And I didn't want to do that. And that's what cats do, right? Like that's the difference between a cat and a dog. A cat thinks they're king. A dog thinks you're king. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's why we only have one cat. I like. All right, he, that's it. She wouldn't respond. Wouldn't respond. Wouldn't respond. And week or two passes, she's out of codeine, she's out of liquor, she stops at the store and gets her some. And on the way home from the store, she feels this presence again, and she yells out, I would rather die before I accept you. That was a Saturday night, the next morning she gets up and she goes to church for some reason, hungover. She says, I'll stay for the sermon today. Normally she would just stay for the worship. I don't know why she would do that. I always think the sermon's the best part of the whole service. But anyways, um, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and she said, it got, he finished, the preacher finishes, and they get to the benediction, and she runs out and runs home to her. And she, she, she felt like this presence was, was just following her. She said she, she put her hand on the doorknob of her houseboat, about to open the door. And finally, she just takes her hand off, and she turns around, and she yells out, Fine! I quit! And she dropped to her knees outside of her houseboat and said, All right, you can come in. And on that day, she found what she was looking for. From that day forward, her life was full of purpose. She's one of the greatest Christian writers there is right now. Have you found what you're looking for? Or do you come here a little bit in pain and a little bit like, I don't know that I'm fulfilled in this life? Well, then answer the third question. Will you say yes to Jesus? That's Mary's response when she hears his voice is very simple. One word, master. Master. Rabbi, she falls at his feet. She begins to worship him. It's true. See, because I believe Easter Sunday and the resurrection is more than an event on the calendar. It's an experience. It's a moment in time. It's the beginning. Like we literally in this moment have the beginning of a movement of God in her life. Today, I believe that same resurrection power is here for you. See, here's what I know. When you encounter your master, our response is to surrender. When you encounter him, your response has to be surrender. Today, you've encountered him through music and through video and through all kinds of, of different things. And now through the word of God. You, you need to have the same response of, of the one Thomas, who we think of as a doubter. The same response, look at it a little bit longer, farther down in John 20. It says, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them, though the doors were locked because they were, they were afraid. They were afraid. And Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. I'm thinking, man, if you just walk through the door, there ain't no peace right now. Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Somebody today, you're doubting. You're questioning. You don't even know why you're here. Can I tell you today, man, you looking for purpose in the midst of your pain? You just need to say yes to Jesus. The same words of Thomas. Because I'm here to tell you, you can't work your way there. Michael Bloomberg, the former mayor of the city of New York, I don't care about your politics, you know, whatever. I, I don't know what New York City politics, but he was, he was doing a news conference one day, and he was telling everybody about how great he was. And, woo, I'm great. And, man, I've done all of this for the city of New York. And, man, it's great. And, man, I've done so much. When, I get, when it comes time for, for me to, to go to heaven, I'm not even stopping for the interview. 
Like, I'm, if there is an interview, man, there's no need for me to stop because, man, I've earned my place there. I've earned my place in heaven. I'm here to tell you that's the greatest lie that Satan is trying to tell people today because you can't earn your way there on your own. You only get there through Jesus. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, come on, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, today you will be saved. Today you can be just like the man who hung next to Jesus on the cross when he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. You have to confess he's the Lord of all. Confess that he fed 5,000. That he walked on water. That the resurrection is more than an event to you. That literally it is the miracle. It is the sign that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Some friends have been missionaries all around the world. And they were in uh, Bangladesh. One of them told a story at a meeting I was at once. And they're, they're telling this story about, about showing the Jesus film. And when I've been on mission trips, we've showed the Jesus film. And if you've ever seen the Jesus film, it just literally walks through the Gospels. And it gets to this point, and they're beating Jesus, and they're whipping him, and then he dies on the cross. In this one Bangladesh village, the people started going crazy and screaming like, no, no, no. And there's this one little man comes out of the side, and he was, he was of the village. He's like, whoa, stop, stop, stop. I mean, the people are like rioting, going crazy. Like, how can these missionaries do this? And he yelled out, don't be afraid. He gets up. I've seen the movie before. He gets up. He ruined the ending. But can I tell you, he gets up. He not only gets up, he got up. He got up with resurrection power for you and for me. And today he wants you to say yes to him as, as your Lord. So if you grab that card that we asked you to fill out in the beginning, I'm going to talk to you about A, B, C, and D. Everybody should have a card like this and everybody can fill it out. And that's why we give everybody one. Even I don't care if you've been here since the beginning of the church. I still want you to fill it out. I make my kids fill this thing out, all right? And they've literally been here from the beginning. But maybe you're here today and you need to check box A and say, man, Matthew, I've already put my trust in Jesus. Then I want to tell you, you just need to believe on. Keep believing. But maybe you're here today and you'd say, you know what, Matthew? Today, I need to begin to trust him, him today. I need to ask Jesus into my life today. Today can be your day to do just that. I needed to hear the words, and I've heard the voice as just clear as Mary did. And today I need to say, Jesus, I need you to save me. I need to ask you to forgive me and come into my life today. Or maybe you're here and you'd say, Matthew, you know what? I'd love to consider a bit more before I make that decision. And that's fair. And I want you to know I'm happy that you're here. I'm glad you're here. And I would love to have a chance to chat with you. I'll be right up here after service, man. Stop by. We'll set up a coffee or a lunch. And uh, we'll go do that. We'll talk about life. We'll talk about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I'm here to tell you the greatest decision I've ever made in my life. He changed my life. Or maybe you're here today and you're like, you know what, Matthew? I don't ever intend to make that decision for Jesus. I don't ever intend to cross that line of faith. And I want you to hear, I'm glad you're here. But, but I believe you're going to make that decision. If you'll just stay with me for a while. You'll see it, you'll hear it, you'll experience it. So I want you just to take some time right where you're seated. If you're going to check box B, it's very simple. Just say right there in your seat, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I'm broken. I, and, and recognize your pain. Tell him what it is. This is where I'm hurting. Just, just tell him right now. And say, Jesus, would you come in? Would you give me the purpose? Would you help me find what I'm looking for today? Father, I pray right now in this moment. Pray right now in this moment that people would be responding to you. Not to me, but to your, to your word. God, may you be nudging and whispering in their ears right now. Telling them that, hey, I get your pain. I love you in spite of your pain. I'll help you walk through your pain. Help them to know more of you. 
God, may they experience today the champion of all time. In your name I pray. Let's worship him. Come on, let's stand and sing as we, as we worship a risen Savior today.